You're representing um, a particular client whose mother died. Is that correct? Um, That's how many? Correct. How many people are? I mean, I last I saw it was some. Of it's more than thirty-eight thousand claims against Johnson and Johnson. How are those thirty-eight thousand uh, claimants or more likely to get a remedy? Uh, I'm assuming there's a class action, but is there a settlement for all those people that can be resolved at this point? So, so there are two groups of claimants with claims, asbestos-related claims against Johnson and Johnson. There are individuals like my clients who have mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the lining yeah. of the chest or the abdomen um, that's only caused by asbestos. And then there's a much larger group of individuals who are suffering from ovarian or endometrial or uterine cancer um, that are also alleging that their cancers were caused or contributed to by asbestos contaminated baby powder effectively. Yeah. Um, those, the, the ovarian cancer cases, if we just call them that for simplicity's sake, are mostly consolidated in the federal court in New Jersey in what's called a multi-district litigation. It has many of the same characteristics of a class action, but actually everybody has their individual claims still. And, and now that the case has been dismissed again, um, the multi-district litigation will resume, assuming that Johnson & Johnson doesn't file a third fraudulent bankruptcy. This sounds like a case that could take decades, you know, to fully resolve. Is that fair to say? Well, it all depends. I mean, the, the reality of it is you can say, well, this would take decades if we tried each individual case to verdict. But that's not how litigation works. And, and Johnson & Johnson knows it. Johnson & Johnson has resolved many mass torts where their products were alleged to have harmed thousands or tens of thousands of individuals. And there's always a time where those cases are litigated and there are negotiations in the court system. And almost always they reach some sort of mass resolution. But not through the bankruptcy courts. Exactly. Have they used the bankruptcy court in the past for any of these mass torts you're talking about? Not that I'm aware of. And what's critical here is that individual claimants, people who have been harmed by these dangerous products, re retain the choice as to whether they want to participate in a negotiated settlement or whether they want to go and have a trial. That's their mm -hmm. right as an American under the Seventh Amendment and under every state constitution. And, and what Johnson & Johnson is trying to do and what the other companies like Georgia Pacific who have filed these fake bankruptcies are trying to do is force claimants to accept a settlement even if they don't want to as long as they can meet the threshold that was set up in the bankruptcy code of 75 percent of claimants accepting a, a negotiated settlement and that's mm -hmm. why this is so pernicious it's so offensive to the constitution there's enough money in the j and j companies to pay everybody 100 cents on the dollar as determined by a jury johnson and johnson admits that freely they just don't like it. And, and, and the bankruptcy courts are for people that are bankrupt, not for people that just want a better deal. It's interesting. Why do you think the Supreme Court is hearing the Purdue case? Why uh, versus, you know, J&J, &J, this has been going on for some time. Is there a particular reason why that case you think resonates that it would go to the highest court in the land? Well, I think what, what the Sacklers are trying to do um, it is very difficult to accept what they want to do, having taken billions of dollars out of the company for their own personal enrichment. And as I understand it, as reported by the courts, having placed those assets beyond the reach of the American legal system. Um, and there's discussion of that in the various filings in the Sackler case uh, and the Purdue Pharma case as to how the Sacklers have, and, and this is a, generalization, how they have attempted apparently to hide their money. Um, yep. Now they want to be able to give some of that back and get basically a get out of jail free pass yeah. uh, without ever having to subject themselves to the scrutiny of the bankruptcy system. And if, like the court says, there's not enough money to go around in the Purdue case, even if you took every penny that the Sacklers have and every penny that Purdue Pharma has, um, you know, in that situation, if the Sacklers want bankruptcy relief, they should file for bankruptcy, right? And, and 
then we can go ahead and negotiate a resolution to that bankruptcy or um, you know, have it go ahead to conclusion and have the judge rule. Uh, the difference between J&J &J and, and the Sacklers and Purdue is I think it's pretty well acknowledged that in the case of Purdue, even if you took all the money from the Sacklers, there's not enough money to pay all the victims 100 cents on the dollar. There's just mm -hmm. not enough to go around. Um, for Johnson & Johnson, it's much worse because J&J &J affirmatively claims that it has more than enough money to pay all the victims 100 cents on the dollar. They just don't want to. They want finality, they want to remove individual choice and limit people's constitutional rights to a jury trial. And that's just wrong. So do you this, think- but, do you Come back to your question about the Supreme yeah. Court. They took the Sackler case because the Johnson & Johnson case isn't before it. It's not right. in a procedural posture where they would have a chance to rule. J&J &J had that opportunity when their first fake bankruptcy filing was dismissed by the Third Circuit as being a bad faith filing. Johnson & Johnson claimed that it was going to ask the Supreme Court to review uh, to review the case, and then it backed down and just filed a second bankruptcy. And I suspect that's likely what will happen here. They'll file a third one rather than having the Third Circuit tell them that they've done something wrong again. 